If you dare to place 12 concert grand pianos in different botanical garden settings and invite people to come play and hear whatever piano music inspires them, they will come. Hundreds of pianists from all music genres and thousands of piano music devotees have been descending on San Francisco's Botanical Garden for 10 days each September for these free-form, all-day piano recitals called Flower Piano. So that whole kind of recital vibe um, is kind of subverted with what we're doing. <laughs> we don't have to go shh all the time. Yeah. 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 So it's a much more comfortable fun environment to share with friends. Yeah, I'm gonna show some of the screws in the front leg. Dean Mermel and Mauro Fortissimo share a common love of the piano and a healthy disdain for indoor piano recitals confined to overly controlled environments. Things in the concert hall, you know, people are kind of quiet and don't move and they're kind of stiff. I, I think this is a bit liberating to play outdoors. Mauro Fortissimo is a transplanted Argentinian pianist, sculptor, and performance artist. Easy, easy, easy. He started this outdoor piano movement by clandestinely putting a piano on a bluff along the Northern California coast near his studio, so he and others could play in nature. And to hear the waves crashing, the tide coming and going, and you play and you breathe along with that, it's quite an experience. For an encore, he and Dean Mermel put 12 pianos out above the coastline the following year, this time with official permits. And even more pianists and spectators came. Newspapers, TVs, radios, they all came and they became a big thing. And uh, it gave me my 50 minutes of fame. It also caught the attention of San Francisco city officials and art patrons looking to celebrate its botanical garden's 75th anniversary with something special and participatory. The idea is just to invite anybody to play. So this is also a difference with a, with a concert hall. This is audience participation uh, in the sense that they come from nine to five, anybody could sit at the piano and play. From 12 to three during the day long sessions, several of the pianos are reserved for professionals like Hunter Nowak. He has been doing piano recitals in unique open spaces around the country. Most of the performances are more spontaneous. Joseph Torres took advantage of the setting and the moment to play before a public audience for the first time. I was being pushed by my friends here <laughs> who were telling me to play. That's the most difficult thing for me is getting over the nerves to play in front of other people. A lot of children and a lot of adults have never played in front of people before. The only place they've ever played is with their music teacher or in front of their girlfriend and their, um, you know, or in my case, in front of my cat. Pianist and composer Kennedy Verrett incorporated the botanical garden's elements in his original composition, celebrating the role nature can play in music. So our purpose here is to highlight that and to also be in concert with not just ourselves, but with the birds, the sword ferns, and with these ancient relics. So I know I'm in New Zealand, but I've got to get to Africa. So if I hear some uh, boogie woogie and some classical music. Everyone gets lost trying to find the piano. Stephanie Linder heads the gardens of Golden Gate Park, where Flower Piano has become its largest annual event. We have 55 acres and 12 pianos, and they're tucked in all different nooks and crannies. But they find their way, and the music sort of guides them. This combination of the environment and the performing arts, how important is it for the people who come here? Well, it's really important. I mean, we see public gardens as a public health strategy, and we know that being in places like this uh, lowers your blood pressure, lowers your cortisol, stress hormones, activates your brain in ways that it normally doesn't work. And so music does the same thing. And you combine those things, it's pretty spectacular. Take this improvisation by Harry White, a lifelong pianist and retired city gardener who stopped playing at home because of his progressing Alzheimer's. Along with his wife and caregiver, he was able to find and play all 12 pianos during this year's Flower Piano. 
I've come across children so young here that they had to sit on a stack of their music books just to play, and they couldn't reach the pedals, of course. It's pretty mind-blowing to see that connection of music starting to happen at such a young age. You know, as a kid, uh, I went to conservatory for five years, and we couldn't, we didn't have a piano at home. I should, and eventually, my parents bought a piano, and I remember seeing them coming down the street, pushing a piano with few friends, a full of all upright, and I was so happy. And uh, yeah, I kind of knew then that yeah, I could get along with the pianos the rest of my life. Morrow's lifelong love affair with the piano includes salvaging discarded pianos he collects and restores for these outdoor events otherwise destined for the dump and landfill. I like to think the composers would like it because it lets people experience it in a new way, in a way that they can approach it with a sense of wonder because what's that piano doing under this tree? You know, it's not, it's, it's the kind of thing where it kind of short circuits your brain for a second and lets something else come in. By taking a piano out of its comfort zone, these flower piano events are connecting piano music to more people each year in their comfort zone. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Mike Saray in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park.